delta of Nigeria up to, uh, to full-scale civil war. Um, and of course, a lot of my work has been about that. Um, I think the um, we've got to get used to. First of all, we've 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 got to escape our fantasies. And I went through the, the sort of post-conflict election stuff because it's an example of where um, there's been a lot of wishful thinking. We want to believe that um, if only there were an election and that then produces a legitimate government, that that's the way to do it. You know, people will recognize you know, the government as legitimate. The only people who recognize the government as legitimate after an election in these societies are the donors and the people who win. And that's just blindingly obvious, right? Um, but, it's, but, it, but we need to just face that reality. Um, so elections might be worth holding in these contexts, but they're not the solution. We've, we've overemphasized that as a solution. So what are the, what are the alternatives, right? Um, one is peacekeeping. And I uh, try and evaluate the efficacy of peacekeeping. And actually, as far as I can see, the first person who's really done that seriously by getting data, a lot of data off the United Nations. And it took seven months to bash that data into a shape where you could actually analyze it statistically, which tells you that nobody was keeping the data with a view to getting any analysis done. It was being kept as a sort of bureaucratic archiving rather than as a, let's find, let's use this as a source of guidance. Um, and uh, peacekeeping is the new, uh, I was going to say, it's the new policy battleground, within, certainly within uh, Africa, that it's quite unpopular with governments, because governments see it as big money, uh, they see it as uh, a bit of an infringement on their sovereignty. So notice that... Uh, the, post, the new post-conflict government of Burundi, um, about the first thing it did was expel all the peacekeepers. Right? Not literally the first thing it did. I think the first thing it did was uh, imprison the opposition, torture them, sell the presidential plane, and import guns. But, uh, but then it expelled the peacekeeping, the UN and the United Nations peacekeeping forces. Right? Um, so um, peacekeeping forces are a really contentious issue. It's a very big budget area. If it's not effective, it's huge amounts of money being wasted. Um, and it's very sensitive. It's, it's, it's somebody was saying to me yesterday, the uh, uh, DPKO is the new uh, international fund. It's the new IFIs in Africa. That's where the, uh, the new opposition is, because it's seen as big and powerful. Um, and uh, an affront to the, the sovereignty of, uh, of these little states. Right? So it's a really important area where I've scratched the surface of the research, uh, but there needs to be a lot, lot more. Uh, on the basis of my analysis, so far, it looks that peacekeeping is much maligned, that actually it's pretty effective. Right? But let's, you know, we need, let's see. Let's see. It sure isn't always and everywhere. But on balance, at the moment, it seems to be um, a, uh, uh, an effective way of bringing risks down. Um, as is economic development, but economic development takes time. It's a slow burn. You know, by the end of a decade, you've done something on the economic front, but you've got to get through that decade. Sorry, we've got to speed up. I've got a uh, gentleman here who's had his hand up. Please identify yourself. Sir. Thank you. Uh, Masuzi is from the Embassy of Afghanistan, a country in the bottom of the bottom one billion. Uh, you alluded to this in your speech, although um, uh, I'd like you to expand on it if you could, or maybe I should just wait to read the book instead. But the needed, the need that we have now for reforming our institutional um, instruments, mm. the ones that have been in existence since the Second World War. And perhaps you, you alluded to the G8, uh, 
as being you know, one way of going about. But can you expand on your thoughts about other instruments that are institutional? You also alluded about you know, cabinet level, country type of attention to development, but from a global perspective, is there a need for creation of new instruments, institutional instruments? Maybe, you know, the emerging things such as BRIC, you know, that's gone by itself, but others that address, you know, this new century. Yeah, I think the, um, um, I think that's a, that's a fair point. Um, I'll, I'll take, um, I'll take, to, I'll just take just two sort of examples. Um, one is the, the new uh, Peace Building Commission, um, which sh should be very pertinent for Afghanistan. Right? What should a Peace Building Commission be doing, in my view? I was invited up there in October to, to talk to them. Um, to my mind, it should be um, not micromanaging particular situations which is what it's doing at the moment. Right? It was given two countries as a brief, Burundi and Sierra Leone. Burundi, which didn't want it, and Sierra Leone, which didn't need it. So it's sort of, that wasn't a good start. Um, what it should be doing, to my mind, is trying to collect the evidence and think through what should be, as it were, the, the normal evolutionary architecture of a post-conflict state. How should a post-conflict state typically evolve? What's a satisfactory path? So that all players, the government itself in the country, and the donors, and DPKO and all that sort of stuff, can actually coordinate around some common uh, vision. And it's much better to get that agreed internationally, ex ante, than what we do now which is ad hoc, ex post interference. A government does something that some donor doesn't like, and then they try and react by cutting aid or whatever. And so we get maximum of friction and interference with minimum of actual impact with the present style of no agreed benchmarks, no agreed path, but lots of ad hoc intervention. So that's one example of how we could use, it's good that we've got the Peace Gilding Commission. I was very surprised we got it. I think it's a great new piece of architecture and it's just not being used well at the moment. That is, it's missing its opportunity. Um, a humbler, but still really pretty important area is, um, is how countries should manage uh, natural resources windfalls. That's a big, big story. It's the first order story in Africa at the moment, is the management of natural resource windfalls. I look globally at what are the consequences of these things. And globally, the story is that in the short term, growth goes up, and in the long term, uh, the country is a lot poorer, a lot poorer. So the this, I found firm statistical basis for all this lose stuff about the resource curse. The resource curse is a, a bitter reality. There are fairly simple things that should be done in a country to guard against misuse of these windfalls. One way of conceptualizing it is you need some sort of fiscal constitution. Over the last 30 years, the big economic constitutional innovation in developed countries has been independent central banks. The counterpart in resource-rich countries isn't independence of central banks. That's not the issue. It's, the, the, it's, it's fiscal policy and particularly use of these natural resource revenues. And so they need the same sort of long-term commitment mechanisms that are implied with central banks, but, but for a different thing. Now, at the moment, there is zero international guidance as to... Um, what should be done in these countries. When Ngozi arrived in Nigeria, she just had to make it up. As soon as she arrived, it became something called the Fiscal Responsibility Act, which got through the Congress 
about a week before the Congress closed. Right? Um, and let's hope that that does its effect. Right? Now, what, what is needed is that sort of architecture laid out so that it's on the shelf, ready for any reformer to take off the shelf. And let me close here with a little example of what really brought it home to me why we need something on the shelf. When East Timor first got its independence, I was uh, invited to East Timor to address the, the new government. So I flew in, and uh, I found this basically a bunch of innocents um, uh, who, who, to their credit, knew that they knew nothing. Um, I couldn't speak to them directly because they didn't speak any English. Everything had to be interpreted through Portuguese. They, they got this oil and gas coming from Australia. They knew that. And so they thought, what should we do? How do we learn about how to manage this oil and gas? They knew they knew nothing. And so they decided they better go and look at some country that was already doing it. So which country should they look at? Well, they better have oil. That seemed pretty sensible, right? But then they didn't speak any English. Actually, what they spoke was Portuguese. So they sent a team to a country which had oil and spoke Portuguese. Right. Can you work that out? They sent a team to learn how to manage oil revenues to Angola. Now, if you want to learn what I think about that, which is quite spicy, <laughs> you know what you've got to do. Question in the back here, Anne? We on? Um, Anne Van Dusen, uh, Georgetown University. Um, I, I'd like to go back to the non-aid development policies. And uh, a number of uh, economists have written recently about uh, the role of liberalizing uh, labor migration, opening up immigration as a development tool. And I wonder if you can comment on that, and especially whether you think that that is a tool that's particularly relevant for the bottom billion. Yeah, I think it's a, a, a very much a two-edged sword for the bottom billion, actually. Um, the, uh, and the reason is that the bottom billion have very few skilled people, very few educated people. They're, they're, the typical, they're, they're twice over um, condemned. One is that they've got their share of their population that is in higher education is tiny partly because over the last 15 years, donors have focused exclusively on primary education, so their universities have fallen apart. So the very few, small share of their population with any significant level of education, but on top of that, they've got very small populations. Right? This billion people is divided into nearly 60 countries. Right? So you bring those two together, you don't have a critical mass of educated people in these societies, which is why the reform process is so slow. Reform has to come from within, and there just isn't a critical mass of informed people within the society who can develop a strategy based on an informed diagnosis. One simple manifestation of this lack of critical mass is there's no financial press in any bottom billion country we're speaking of. The market's just too small. Now, where does migration play out? Who are the developed countries going to let in? It's the most skilled. That's, the, in practice, the people who will out-migrate. And so the bottom billion countries have already hemorrhaged their skilled labor. Now, it's true that they get a flow back of money for a while, depending upon how long those contracts last. And it's true that potentially, when they do start to reform, the diaspora could be a source of skills. It's actually very difficult to get the diaspora back. Very simple reason. What happens? The, uh, after a few years, uh, the, uh, the people who left the country have kids who are growing up in America or Europe, and the 
the man might say, I think we ought to go back, and the wife says, you go and check, what are the schools, what are the clinic health services? Yeah. And there aren't any, and then the answer is, we're not going back. Yeah. So, um, I think it's a, um, a very much a two-edged sword, uh, this migration, that um, uh, it benefits the migrants, but it denudes the country of what is already a critical shortage. And so I, I, I think it's, uh, it's quite worrying. I mean, I think quite a few of these international globalization processes, which work brilliantly for the four billion, actually work perversely right at the bottom. So you know, migration was just great for India and China they came, they got skills, they went back. That's just great. Yeah. Try it in Sierra Leone. Right. Okay. You've been patiently waiting. Thank you. I'm Nancy Angelo with the Federal Aviation Administration and uh, work with a number of African countries on improving their aviation safety which requires a very large investment on their part to meet international standards. Our um, response to them is always that it can help trade and that will pay for itself. I'm wondering if, in your view, that's the correct response. Um, and I, I fly around in Nigeria, so in one sense I'm very thankful for your efforts <laughs> to, uh, to, to, to raise safety levels. Um, um, I, uh, I think it's awfully important that um, the bottom billion um, have pretty deregulated um, air services, with a lot of private and competitive air services, especially because so many of them are landlocked. Right? If you're going to be landlocked, you better not be airlocked as well, and a lot of them are. I'm just trying to arrange to go back to Sierra Leone in a couple of weeks, and there just aren't enough flights you know, for me to get there and back in the window I've got, um, let alone the internal flights. Mm -hmm. um, and so what, uh, what Africa needs is a lot of, not cowboy operations, but a lot of things like sort of Southwest Airlines, in effect, low-cost operators that are pretty efficient. What it's got, what it's had in the past, is the big, lumbering public monopolies that are very high cost. Mm -hmm. yeah? And making that transition is really difficult. And getting that, getting those level, getting that process right. It, you can't have zero uh, safety regulations. Um, should they have the same standards as we have? Probably not, actually. Probably not. Yeah? Um, our systems are designed basically for zero I do a lot of flying. I feel far safer in a plane than in a car. Yeah. Zero risk is kind of um, a luxury in these environments, right? If I drive from Lagos to Ibadan, I know I take my life in my hands, right? I'm willing to take my life in my hands to the same extent in a plane, right? What I'm not willing to do is suicide. Right? So the level, there needs to be a, regular, a level of safety regulation, but just importing the standards that are appropriate here probably imposes such cost levels that we drive out the phenomenon that we need, which is low cost, not just passenger, but especially low cost freight. So uh, you know, it's, it's kind of getting standards right for local conditions rather than just importing ours. I had a question way in the back here. It's been answered, thank you. It's been answered, okay. And you, there was another hand raised here? Yes. Hello, my name is Carmen Eldridge. I'm with uh, National Defense University and the new uh, Reconstruction and Vital Infrastructure Industry Study. Um, and as I sit here listening and over my studies over the last year, uh, I really think we're talking ultimately about changing people's way of life, uh, changing behavior, changing a culture. 
How do your instruments, your policy instruments, ad address doing this? Yeah, um, the, uh, I'm just reviewing a book which um, uh, argues that it's all culture and that the, as it were, the, the, the policy instruments have to be about changing the culture rather than anything else. Um, and on the whole, I don't agree with that view. I think clearly culture has to change massively. That's not, that's not in dispute. Right? The question is um, partly which is easier for policy to change, culture or the other stuff. Uh, and secondly, whether the culture will, as it were, come along as other things change. Um, and to some extent, it will. I mean, let, let me give you a, a tale of the South Korea. I've got a friend from South Korea. South Korea is a dramatic case of culture change because um, it's been the most rapidly developing country in the world. I mean, the, the economy grew so fast. Right? My friend says she remembers in her youth the culture of the streets was you ambled along. And now the culture of the streets is New York. Right? Now, why is that? Why is that? Uh, in the same book I'm reviewing, uh, it describes a, a campaign for punctuality conducted in Latin America by the government, which kind of didn't work. Right? <laughs> um, in fact, the president turned up late for the launch of the campaign. Which <laughs> um, but, um, uh, but, uh, but why did attitudes to time change so profoundly in South Korea? And, there's an obvious answer. Time became just one whole lot more valuable. Yeah. And so people speeded up naturally in response to that. And it, of course, you know, behavior changed, attitudes changed, but they, they were in, those changes were induced naturally by the evolution of the economy. Now, I don't want to push that too far. Right? I think there are, um, especially, I think that there are things that ordinary people can do collectively to change attitudes. In 19th century Europe, a very good example was the temperance movement. Mm -hmm. yeah? Organizations like the Salvation Army were trying to address behavioral problems amongst the poor and ordinary people, and they succeeded. Mm -hmm. yeah? uh, and we see the same sort of organizations, grassroots organizations today. Yeah? Um, I think they're marvelous, actually. Um, whether they have much to do with government policy, I am a bit sceptical. Right? I mean, if governments, frankly, if governments can't, we're dealing with governments that can't get the basics of economic policy right. The idea that they can n navigate culture seems, I mean, the, the, the recommendation in this book by um, a man called Harrison uh, is that governments should retain monopoly control over the media so that they can influence culture. Mm -hmm. And his, his model for that is the BBC, which was fine. I mean, you know, the BBC, I, I approve of the BBC. I grew up in a monopoly television environment when I was a kid. And it was all right, right? Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, TV DRC is not the BBC. Um, and so the, the second best is instead of a, a, a wondrous government of DRC uh, gently coaxing the culture into more functional channels, just let's have competition in the media. Right? Harris? There's a hand back here I can't quite see. To whom yeah. it is attached. Uh, Seamus Finn with the Oblates of Mary Macklick. Uh, to, I'm, uh, particularly, I was going to ask another question, but on your last comments, I guess, I, I think the culture issue uh, is a lot more important than I'm getting from your response in, in my experience on development issues and uh, whether it's as, as uh, amenable to uh, different uh, rational and legal and regulatory uh, a prescription, I'm not sure, but I guess my other question was uh, on your earlier comments that it almost seems to me that you suggest that one can take the countries that house these billion who are uh, outside of everything at the moment and that you're going to get some level of agreement by the governments of the world uh, 
to uh, put them in a special category and then uh, allow them some special concessions and that there might be some agreement about a process of development uh, and that integrates them into uh, you know, a system that's already operating. And uh, it, stri it strikes me that that's almost a utopian kind of uh, expectation given the number of geopolitical realities that we're dealing with uh, alone in the world today. And then to, I think, expect that kind of level of coordination from the G8. Uh, <laughs> I'm just not that optimistic, personally, in terms of that uh, kind of a framework. Yeah, I mean, I'm. I don't want to. Uh, you know, I'm. I'm not a dreamer. I'm a, quite a sort of practical person. Um, I think um, first of all, um, the bottom billion will force themselves onto the agenda of the developed country governments, because um, in a globalized media. Um, the problems of the bottom billion will just increasingly demand attention. The governments of the major countries will be expected to do something. Uh, and they'll be scratching around to think, what can they do? Yeah? Also, as the bottom billion diverge, um, they'll generate a range of social problems, mainly for their neighbors mainly for their neighbors, but also for us. Um, and, uh, and that will, again, force attention. Yeah. Uh, thirdly, um, the actual cost of effective interventions is really not very high. Yeah. We take the example of the trade policy I've given you. Yeah. Is a goer costing America very much? Nothing, right? Nothing. It's not worth thought. Right? Would changing EBA cost Europe anything? Nothing. It's not worth a thought. Is 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 a more successful Africa a market threat to anybody? Of course not, right? So, the actual cost of doing something effective is is no higher than the cost of doing things that are ineffective. Um, so I'm not as uh, gloomy as you are. I think the, the real reason our strategies have been so damned ineffective is that we've just not focused on the problem. Yeah. The development agencies, for their own reasons, have defined the problem in terms of aid and defined the problem very broadly in terms of all the developing countries in the world, the five billion, in fact, more properly, they define the problem as everywhere but the bottom billion. Just look where the World Bank puts its staff. Right? When I was in the World Bank, I went to the Central African Republic. I was such a rarity that when I got off the plane, I was met by a television crew <laughs> because there were no World Bank staff in the Central African Republic. Meanwhile, there were 134 World Bank staff in Indonesia. Right? Now, if you try and tell me that the 134th person from the World Bank in Indonesia is more productive and valuable than having one person in Central African Republic, it's ridiculous. Right? So it's not even that the development agencies were spreading their resources thinly across the globe they were spreading them lumpily anywhere but the bottom billion, because the bottom billion, nobody wanted to go. Mm -hmm. yeah. The bank is at the moment going through the agony of trying to force its people, its staff, to work on bottom billion countries as a criterion for promotion. And there's been huge kickback from staff. <laughs> yeah. I believe as of yesterday, it just got unstitched. <laughs> yeah. So, that's the reality. We're starting to run down time. You had a last question. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jerry Norris with the Hudson Institute here in Washington. You mentioned earlier that the uh, aid agencies need to convert to 
development agencies, if I have that correct. And I, I wondered if, if you felt that the recent report from the Canadian government on, on the need to, to change its own aid agency and a recent editorial in the Financial Times about the Asian Development Bank, its need to reinvent itself, that it had no divine right to exist in its current status. If these might be two signals that perhaps there is some movement. I think there is movement, absolutely. I think there, I think there really is. There's, uh, there's actually, in a way, sort of greater competition. Um, governments are realizing they can put their money through multiple channels, and they've got a choice. Um, why have they got all these agencies? They're actually, um, there are actually now more international agencies than there are bilateral agencies. If you think about it, it's absurd. I mean, you, you'd imagine, why do you have international agencies to reduce the coordination problem of the bilaterals? But instead of that, we've had proliferation. Uh, they're, just, they're just too many. Right? Um, so I think uh, we may well go through a process of greater coherence. Um, it would certainly be nice to think so, yeah. And I think also that there's probably a, a growing awareness that there are these other instruments um, that we have to use. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm reasonably hopeful there. Thank you. I was struck, Paul, by, uh, and I'm sure you know this in the book, that, that uh, there are synergies between these various instruments. The, the one that's most obvious because it's on the agenda and I happen to be the person you're working on it is the uh, quote unquote aid for trade. That in the bottom billion, uh, the rich countries certainly can offer, they can actually improve Angola a great deal, a, uh, a free ride, to put it in non pejoratively sense, for the, for the countries in the bottom billion. The other is that if they're going to respond, uh, they're going to need certain things that they don't have, infrastructure, uh, telecommunications, uh, networks, uh, and education, and health in that case. Uh, so there must be, uh, particularly for these countries, rather than for India, which does quite well by itself, a synergy between policies which uh, could be very productive. There really has to be, but I'll, I'll close with one really good test that we can take to every development agency. You can ask it, what has been the implications for your strategy in Africa of the renewal for five years of AGOA? That renewal for five years of AGOA has substantially changed opportunities for a few African countries. Only a few, right? For the others, zero effect, zero implication. Right? So it would be nice to ask the development agencies has your strategy for, say, Kenya changed relative to your strategy for, say, Mali? Yeah. And I can tell you what the answer is so far. I can predict it. But over the next few months, there's got to be a waking up that changes in trade policy indeed imply changes in aid policy. I'll give you one better than that. If you walk into the U.S. State Department as the part of the development agency and ask the African Bureau what impact it's had on their policies towards uh, overall towards sub-Saharan Africa, I'll bet you get a blank stare. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been Thank fascinating. Uh, it was an extremely provocative presentation. I think it's marvelous because I agree with all of it. So. Uh, but you're going to have to buy the book and find out whether you agree with it, all of it, or not. Uh, so I want to thank you all for coming. I thank Paul for being here. And you'll be outside the autograph. Indeed, I will. Okay. Yeah. Good.